So I'm going to continue on a little Bagua journey with you. All right. Uh, so you studied with Leon Kai Chi. Learned. Uh, he, he he taught two basic sets: the linking palms and then the Yin Fu eight palms. Um, did you you went on to learn Bagua from other teachers? Can you talk about that? Well, <coughs> my main other teacher for Bagua is you. <laughs> so I learned I learned the first set from. Leon Kai Chi yeah. with the group, right? And then the second set I did not learn from Leon Kai Chi. Um, I think we had already moved on to some weapons training with the group that I was bringing the monkey staff. Monkey staff, and, yeah. And the Bagua knife. And, um, and then the, the two person set with spear and three section staff. Yes. I got that from him too. So we had sort of moved on to some other things that maybe he was interested in teaching. Or or my, my group was interested in getting, I don't know. Because I had to, I had to somehow entice a group of students to come to Boston with me on, some, on Sunday morning. So it had to be something that they were also interested in. And, um, so uh, the second set, the second info set I got from you when you were still living at your parents' house. <laughs> wow. Out in the yard near the water. Yes. On a weekend, I learned the first four changes on Saturday and the second four changes on Sunday, and that was my main instruction on that. Yeah. Um, now I didn't let much time go by, and I practiced, so I, I was able to acquire it with that little bit. Yeah. And then over the years, I've gotten tidbits from you on. That is my main Bagua form, after it's all been said and done. Yeah. That's my daily Bagua form. I've let, I've let other teachers influence. I mean, I've learned, the most Bagua I learned from was Master Choi. You know, uh, just just the depth of his Bagua knowledge. But And I do his forms, obviously. But that, that second set of eight palms, I can remember it today like it was like it was yesterday. Seeing Leon K. Chi do it on the... The center circle of the basketball court down in the Fenway. Oh, okay. And he stayed right on that circle and he did it with just beautiful stances and that was something that physically moved me. I went, I, I got I want that. I mean, you know, I've had many desires in my life and that was definitely one of them. Mm. And and now I've come full circle because, you know, uh, you know, I, I immersed myself in Master Choi's Bagua. And now I'm kind of coming full circle, and, and that's the form that I really love to do it, and it really informs me. Hmm. Yep. Okay. It was also the form I was doing when I first met Paul Gallagher. Oh, really? Yeah. The form you were learning? No, I was practicing it oh. at, at Omega Institute. Oh, okay. And um, early morning, before, you know, I had to help Master Leon. And I'm I'm doing the Bagua, and I happen to look, and like in like a little grove of trees, there's this guy, yes, standing, and I don't know how long he had been watching. Like a tree. He's yeah. He, for the the duration, I did the Bagua, I did a bunch of stuff, and then when I was done, he came over to me. Then he, en he ended up, and then and that's how I that's how I really that's well, my real I, introduction. I do think, to him. I do think that uh, there is something to that convergence of proximity and time. You know, I mean, yep. it's like, just look at you and I. We, when we met, I was in my early 20s, you were in your late teens. Uh, yeah, I was a you kid. You were like 17. I was you a were, kid, yeah. You were yep. a little kid. Yep. So, but our, 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 our paths crossed, time and proximity, and then again, and then again, and then again, yep. and then, and then uh, again and again. Yeah, and now it's a, it's a conscious, consciously. Well, think of students that come to class. Yeah. Imagine if they come to class for a decade or two decades. Oh, how yeah. many intersections you've had with them? It's just it's just unbelievable. You know, Master Leon would, would always say, "New friends is silver, old friends are gold." Yeah. And uh, last year, when I went up to uh, to Ken Cohen's uh, home in uh, Colorado. And I hadn't physically seen him in probably 15 years. 
And, you know, he greeted me at the door, and that feeling of, I've known you. I, we might not have had a continuous physical contact, but you're like, you're in my heart. Same thing with Paul Gallagher. I mean, we when he moved to Asheville, there was a long period I hadn't seen him. And, right. um, you know, I pity time and space to try to keep brothers and sisters away. Can't do it. It's, it's you know, we are connected. You know, you're, you're, to me, you're gold. Yeah, you too. Absolutely. Cheers to that. Here, cheers. Now, you did study Bagua in the Cheng Tinghua um, lineage. I, uh, I had a, um, I'm trying to think of how I got first introduced to him. In Western Mass, we have the five college area. So a lot of times, some of the more intellectual Chinese would come here to go to school. Because I get asked often, did you go to China? Mm -hmm. and no, because China came to me. So it was, it was right here. So a lot of these guys are coming to do their PhD work or something like that. And uh, so um, Zhang Jay, who is Master, Master Zhang, um, who grew up in Beijing and was part of Liu Bin's group. In Liu Bin, I believe, was a student of uh, Dong Hai uh -huh. So it's in that direct lineage. Although each one of those groups kind of specialized in a different thing, and the Liu Bin's group specialized in a single leg standing meditation. So we've got a whole set I learned from him about single leg standing. Uh, he was kind enough to share the old eight palms with me, which is a purely internal um, bagua set. And it's basically a combination of standing meditation arm postures with Bagua stance work. And uh, Leon Kai Chi specialized in the lion walk. Yeah. He didn't really spend a lot of time on this is what your feet should do. Or, you know, very natural stepping. Very natural. You know how to walk, so go ahead and walk. Yeah. You know, the other things, you know, drop the tailbone, like that kind of stuff. But uh, Master Zhang was really into the mud treading step. So he had all that kind of sliding on the floor. And he was very, very specific about how that should be done. But I learned an animal set from him, which is the primary set that I do, and then the old eight palms. And then a, a, a number of warm-ups and, and some qigong. And, uh, he had a vast array of knowledge also. A full system. He, he, not only a full system, but you know, multiple systems. And he was a graduate of the Peking Opera. Oh my gosh. So, so all that training. He, and had, he had skill, uh, on skill. A uh, really amazing man. And I, I probably spent three or four years studying with him. Uh, you know who was going, going to classes with me, private classes, is Rob Zillin. You know, Rob had mentioned something about that, yeah. that he had learned from him. Oh, so you guys went, you, you were in no, the same we were private? No, we, we would take private, we would share the cost of the private yeah. together. I don't know if he's kept up the sets or not, but, um, yeah. Yeah, it's funny you say that, because I, I, I had done something, and Rob said, oh, that looks like I, what I got from Master John. Yeah, Some I'm stuff. wondering if he, uh, well, I know, uh, I was teaching at full time at the time, so I couldn't go to the evening classes. But he was also teaching at uh, E Street one or two nights a week. So he had a group that he was teaching. And then uh, in the early 90s, he moved out to the Northwest, Pacific Northwest. And I kind of lost in touch with him. I did bring him back for one seminar um, where he taught the wild goose chico. I still do the set yeah. now and again, but I can't say that I do but it. But on the day, uh, daily basis, you have you do p familiar pieces or? Well, I incorporate some of that into what I'm doing daily. Got it. Um, because.
because even you know I'm retired at this point, so I, I'm I'm not able to use the excuse of I don't have the time because I could spend ten hours a day doing martial arts. When I was teaching, I would spend about ten hours a day doing martial arts. Yeah. Um, as the decades go by, I taught for forty-five years, so at some point, you'd like your life to include more than that. <laughs> Make, I heard this quote. It, it's uh, Walter Matson, uh, karate master in Boston. Sure. Um, Make the world your dojo. Don't make the dojo your world. And some of us who teach professionally, the dojo is our world for a, a many hours. You know. Some of it's just trying to make a living. Though. Oh yeah, no, you got to do it. It's not like you know. So when you're when you're past the point of that, um, I've been talking to a Sifu Ray about this. Is that it's sort of like being a college professor when you're in academia. You're surrounded by that environment, and if you were outside of academia in the real world, so academia would be like the dojo in the martial community, right? But if you're outside in the real world, the real world doesn't really care about that. It, it's, it's not, you know. The best thing to do if you have a lot of knowledge about internal practice in regular society is don't bring it up. Don't talk about it. Don't make it very special. Just, you know, it's just something that you do for yourself, and uh, it changes. You know, when you go from a point where people are paying to hear you talk about it, yeah, to the point where in society <laughs> nobody cares. They don't want to hear about it, and they're definitely not going to pay you for it. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, I'm in that point where I'm trying to make this transition. And I would like, I have always wanted, and when I teach people, it, your art should inform the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. If it's not assisting you to be a better husband, wife, brother, sister, friend, go ahead, in, in musician, uh, then I would say, hmm, you might want to like readjust what you're doing. Because you do not want it to be a separate. I heard it was Wynton Marsal Marsalis said, um, you know, at his level of playing music, he said, all my friends are, are the other guys that practice their instrument eight hours a day and then gig on weekends. And he said, I, I don't have any run-ins with, you know, people with a regular schedule. And, you know, and that's all well and good. But, I, you know, I've experienced it and I think you have too. There's a whole big world out there. And it can get lonely, and there's some really interesting people that don't give a fig about martial arts. Or qigong, or spirituality, or whatever it is that just floats my boat. Um, and, you know, I think that's that's part of our hey, so maturing. Think, think about it like this. Yeah, I like to go listen to music. Would you like to learn to play guitar? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I have no interest in, or, usually it would be preceded where, well, I, I, I'm not musical. So. <laughs> I could never do that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, they can do it because they're so talented. Yeah, well... <laughs> the real talent is being able to consistently and persistently practice. You know, when I look at uh, Professor Zhang Manqing, who, you know, our, he's, in our, he's our godfather, he's in our lineage. You know, he's the master of five excellences. Right. Taiji being one of them. What a lot of people didn't know is that he could play piano. He, uh, Master Liang told me he went undefeated in Taiwan playing that, that Chinese chess, the Weiji. Um, he was also an avid hiker. And it just seems that, you know, I mean, I've made this mistake. I've been too narrow. And that when, when, you're, when it's that wide and broad, you meet a lot of different people, you get a lot of different things done, and I, I really look at, you know, as I'm approaching my retirement to, to broaden out and be more like him than, like, well, say, some of the teachers that are, of, One you know. of the things that's interesting to me personally is that when I'm doing something like playing drums or scuba diving or whatever, which part of my personal 
internal cultivation practice is informing that. Mm. So here's one thing. Calm is a superpower, period. Most people don't really spend any time at all in, in trying to enforce a calmness inside. Um, it's only going to be important when you're not calm. <laughs> and then you have the skill to calm yourself. Yes. So like uh, in karate testing, for example, where you have to get up in front of the whole group and do your form. For a lot of people, you know, that, that's, that's like a, a whole mountain to climb. But what it does show to the teacher is that, okay, if you can calm yourself, ready? Go ahead, calm yourself. If you can't, it's like scuba diving and, you know, we've been, um, you know, misled that sharks are dangerous, but still boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then now you're in the water, it's a wild animal, anything could happen. You know that it's not real. Are you able to calm yourself? So, in, in, like in drumming, are you able to maintain a, a, a certain level of engagement without it going over the top? So that you're able to kind of keep time but I'm very interested in the interface of the practices and how it informs the rest of life. Otherwise, you know, I mean, it's just like this whole notion of monks going into the cave. Great, wonderful. There's no distraction, there's no nothing. I mean, if you need to do that, I would say go do that. But I personally think it's higher level that you're able to maintain that level of serenity and calmness inside of a culture yes where you have you know no matter where you are what job you have what school you go to what it doesn't make any difference there's always going to be an individual that's going to be more difficult for you to deal with the people that you already get along with by the way you you have that already <laughs> it's it's the <laughs> It's, it's, you know, switching partners and then you get a, 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 you know, somebody on the other side that's like, you know, if you were just do this a little bit better, you know, we, we would be so <laughs> with no, no responsibility for their own actions. <laughs> I, I've heard this saying that um, you only need to make peace with your enemies. That whole peacemaking and that, that sorting stuff out, you don't do that with your friends, you do that with your enemies. And that, and that's why it's difficult. You don't have to make peace with your, with your, uh, the people that are, that are not giving you any conflict. You also have the, the paradigm that's throughout everything, which is I've been talking a lot with, with Sifu Ray about this a lot, which is at first it's new, so it's new. It's the first date, for example. But then the first date's over. Guess what? The second date's not as new as the first date. And then you got the third date and the fourth date. And it, it's not that they're going to be an enemy, but eventually as time goes on, there's going to be an impasse. Mm -hmm. You just have to allow enough time. Same thing with practices. Eventually you're going to come up against it. And the path of the spiritual warrior, in my opinion, is that when it becomes difficult, you don't turn away. You, you stick with it. Mm -hmm. You just stay. And then oftentimes, just from maintaining attention on it, it just dissolves, mm -hmm. and then you're able to reach a, another level. So you, you've transformed whatever it is, and you've, you're able to surpass that. Whereas the average person, as soon as they come up against it, it bounces them back, and they're actually going the opposite way. They're not making progress forward. Yeah. So I think if, uh, if in the process of practicing internally or externally, um, you can get a deeper level of understanding of that aspect of life. New, not so new, really ordinary. So past ordinary is extraordinary, but it has to be ordinary first. Mm. And this is a very, very tough place to be with things because it gets you know, we get like that with teaching, right? You know, for somebody that goes in and teaches one class a week or, or substitutes for you, that's a new thing. 
but for you, <laughs> that's, that's, so, <laughs> I know the first teaching that you did was probably at my school in Greenfield. Uh, I remember, I remember, um, yes, uh, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to learn from that person. <laughs> Oh, oh, contraire. Oh, that person, yes, I remember some stuff after I went, wow, that was the wrong way to present that material. But I do, I, you know, I really, I, I, uh, I appreciate because you did give me my first teaching gig. Like, literally, you gave me my first experience of like, I mean, I taught, you know, for Master Liang in his classes right, right. Um, under his supervision, but you were like, here you go. And uh, it, was a, it was a really, it was, it was amazing. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you too. I, uh, well, you know the other thing um, I'd like to uh, I, I just like to flesh out for, for my audience. I mean, I, I sure, had the sure, I had sure. the luxury of knowing right. how cool you are, Richard. Uh, and you are, um, but you know you you're you're one of those people like uh, Ken Cohen, like Master Leong, like uh, Leong Keqi. You do have a knack for you know finding amazing teachers and learning amazing arts and getting accomplished in them, which all those have to be put together. Could you talk a little bit about your time studying with Professor Remy Presas and uh, Modern Arnis? And, and um, I know that's definitely one of your one of your arts in your wheelhouse. So, um, making a living at teaching karate, one of the things that a lot of people approach martial arts with originally, and, and I have to say I was part of that too, which is kind of more for nuts and bolts, self-defense reasons. I was, uh, I was a professional musician playing drums in bands at the time in bars and uh, some pretty tough places. It should have been chicken wire. But more than, more than once a night, I would have to run off stage. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was interested in that in terms of martial arts training. And in the karate system that I learned from Sensei McCabe, uh, we did uh, Ed Parker Kempo, self-defense techniques. You know, you grab my lapel, I do this, and, you know, and all, and all of that. And the Kempo guy spent an awful lot of time on that. Mm -hmm. So I learned all of that, you know, uh, you had to have a certain number of those self-defense techniques to make black belt, every belt grade had a certain number of them. And the Kempo guy spent a lot of time on it. And it, it, I can't say that it wouldn't work, but I ran into a couple of difficulties with it. One, if somebody attacks you with a knife, don't do a turning crescent kick. You, you will be dead. Yeah. That, that is not a realistic technique to do. The other thing I ran into is that you teach people a certain thing, you're, you're, you're supposed to be looking at it like an alphabet, and you're only going to use part of it to make that word, or you're going to use part of this technique and part of that technique, but you're going to be able to, you would have them develop to a level where you can improvise with them. But what I ended up getting, uh, most people are not going to practice it at that level. I'm not saying that the method doesn't necessarily work, but it doesn't work unless you put a lot of effort into it. So that's going to be every class. You, you know, yep. We're doing this again. Yeah, we're trying to refine it and get you to be able to do it. Um, but what I found is that somebody would grab them and they'd go, oh, 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 oh. I did the wrong move. Like it was like a kata or something. Uh -huh. They did the wrong move. So then they did the worst possible thing you can do in self-defense, in my opinion, is hesitate. No, you hesitated. No, you didn't do anything wrong. You know, it's the same thing if you're performing a, a, a kata, a form, and you make an error, don't stop. And don't let it out. Don't show anybody that you're, you're, you're experiencing that. Just smile and make up a move. <laughs> do whatever you want. Go like this. I don't know. <laughs> make any difference. Just don't show disappointment. And yeah. it, it's part of this development of indomitable spirit not going to be affected when things go wrong. <coughs> I'm not going to be as affected. Mm. And I was unwilling to do training with people that was going to make them less effective. So that's the long-winded version of, well, why did I search out Arnis? Well, if my search was actually, who is, 
who are, what group of people can make that martial arts work in a real setting? Mm. And there's a lot of really unrealistic stuff out there. Mainly it's too friggin' complicated, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Because I think for self-defense it's the kiss. Keep it simple, stupid, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. If you think that that complex thing's gonna work, I'm not saying that it wouldn't necessarily, but the probability is mm, only by luck. One thing I've been, I've been studying modern tactical martial arts which is, you know, kind of like martial arts that come out of law enforcement and the military. Right. One of their big things is that when your body's flooded with adrenaline, complications go out the window. It's got to be simple. Got to be simple. So uh, I did my research, and in my research, I realized that it was the Filipinos that were, they had some serious, and just spending some time in the Philippines, the, the value of life is very, very low. Mm. There, 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 there are some really tough individuals over there. And uh, just like in China, uh, in ancient times, it was mainly the bandits and the bodyguards that were practicing martial arts, right. professional guards. It was The average people were not involved with that, and they thought that that was kind of for criminals. And right. Ruthless, Ruffians, yeah. Ruthless. Ruffians. Yep. Right? It was distasteful. Yep. So, uh, and then as I continued researching, um, the other thing in terms of uh, studying with somebody, you have this intersection of time. Yeah, you can make that happen. But you also have the inter intersection of proximity. And if you can't get in the proximity at the correct time with that person, even if they're the best, it's not going to make any difference because you're not going to be able to, to do it. So uh, I happen to have one of my classmates, uh, Tommy Campbell, who went to I think North Carolina and ended up studying with uh, one of the professor students down there. And then he came back to Greenfield, and from 84 to 86, I studied our niece with him. Simple things, you know, a lot of coordination exercises like Cinewall or something like that. And then uh, Janet Alfs, uh, one of my peers who ran a studio in East Hampton, Mass, mm. brought the professor in. And that was in 86. Mm. That was my first seminar that I went to with him. And uh, it was magical because he was able to do some things that I went like, I would like to love to be able to do that. Um, and then uh, I went to the first camp in 87, and uh, there was 27 of us. You had to be a black belt to get in. And two of us, myself and Nicanor Snow, at the end of the seven days, we were both promoted to first degree black belt. In our knees. In our knees. I was already a black belt. In, yeah. But it was a, a very confirming, which was, I had up to date been studying with people um, like Master Paul, who uh, had a very, very, very high standard. I think you'll agree. Yep. So uh, it, it a lot of times would feel very difficult to achieve that standard. Some of it was in how many, how much time had gone by. Yes. So even if you're practicing diligently, if you haven't been practicing for X amount of time, it still was a, kind of a bounce check. So this is actually one of my first experiences in martial arts where I had a lot of confirmation about my skills. Mm. And, uh, and then, you know, and then after that, after that camp, in 88, I went out to Michigan, and then the professor asked me to run camps for him out here. So How long did you do that? How many camps did you do? I did, uh, I started in 99, and I went up to 2001, I guess. So 13, I did 13 of them. Wow. How, and how long would the camp be? The camps were uh, 
Thursday through Sunday. So he was originally doing two week camps in Pennsylvania that I never attended. And then he, the one in, in um, Beverly was one week. Mm. But I think that as time goes on, you run into the reality of average folks, mostly the people that came to that one week camp for school owners. So, but average folks can't get that much time off. So then if you're running camps, then, you know, Thursday afternoon orientation up through Sunday, and yeah. then they go home, and then they go back to work on Monday. Yeah. So most of the camps that I did were four days, four day camps. Um, and that's plenty, because it was morning till night. Yeah. I was going to say, two, two weeks is, is a lot of material to learn. And in those days, nobody had cameras. It was really difficult to, you know, you had to notebook and a really good learning learning curve. Well, I filmed a lot, but he would take the film. <laughs> and where it is now, I don't know. But what our niece, the modern our niece coming from the professor at that point in time in the 80s, he had a very, very em heavy emphasis on basics. Very, very heavy. He was not doing a lot of complicated stuff. And then the, anything that was a little more complicated was already developed on a basic level and then you started combining basic things together. And then it would it would reach a, a more of a level of complication. But it was it, it, the the groundwork for it had been set. Instead of just jumping up on that and then never getting the groundwork. Or in modern times, you know, a lot, a lot of students, uh, hopefully none of your audience, are are, are are wanting the more complicated thing first without a foundation for it because the foundation is actually difficult to acquire that's going to take that's not like a whole project you know master Choi would teach he'd say the basic techniques are advanced after you refine them and uh, you know his other thing because he was big on basics too although he could teach some really complicated stuff right um, you know, his, his whole thing is that, uh, you know, the basics, that's the foundation, you have to be able to do it. And he would say, you're going to have a hard time mastering three techniques from one form. So he would say, how many movements are in that form? So you're not going to master them all. And now you have ten forms. And he said, you're going to spend a lot of time doing movements you'll never master. You've got to have your basics that you're mastering. You know, I always think about, uh, you know, because you know, I learned, to, I learned, you know, Richard, Richard's my first drum teacher, my best drum teacher. You know, I think about all those exciting, crazy fills, but in a lot of songs, they're, they're simple fills and they, they fit, you know, the Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, uh, you know, mommy, daddy stuff that just really fits, but it's with that conviction that you play it. Um, yeah. Is it is it a, is it informing or assisting the music? Yes. As opposed to playing a fill and it's very jarring and then it, and then you you look around and you go didn't that look, didn't that look hard? Yep. <laughs> yes, that looked very difficult. Why why aren't you applauding in the middle of the song? <laughs> so um like what uh, give me some idea like what what were you learning from the professor like on because you were also. Uh, you started teaching uh, Arnie's as well. He was really big on that in that um, and again this is where it was very different from my prior training. Um, probably he would encourage people to teach before they were actually ready to teach. Because in the teaching you have the iteration, you have the repetition. Yeah. And frankly, if you're taking somebody from the beginning, you kind of really don't have to have like really high-level skill. Right. As long as you have a, the, the interest of actually imparting the information. So a lot of times someone who's more skilled is so bored with that beginning information, they, they present it, but they were like mm -hmm. dragging their feet doing this. So like, hey, you don't <laughs> have it yet? You know, it's like, hurry up, get it, get it done, you know? <laughs> Whereas a more beginning level teacher might be uh, 
not only interested, but it really excites them. The enthusiasm, be, yeah. Enthusiastically, and, and, you know. So I think that's worth a lot, and I think the professor thought that too. And then if you want to involve people, you have to give them something to be involved with. Because without, without the, the teaching credentials to start teaching, you come to a, a, a weekend seminar or a camp in 2023, then they're going to wait all the way to 24. Mm -hmm. And there's like no continuity in between. So uh, I, th I think it was, it, was, it was relatively genius, I think, to, um, to have that happen. And of course, you know, his, his big thing was propagating our East throughout the world. He dedicated his whole life. Um, did he found that as a system, or did he catalog it as a system, or what he, is his place in that system? He, uh, he learned from his grandfather, Leon, and his father was also involved with Arnis, but they were, uh, uh, they were a military family. And his brother er Ernesto is also, uh, was deceased at this point, but was a very high level Arnisador. He was really good, really good. Those guys got some really good training, no doubt about it. Um, yeah, the, the, one of the things I got from the professor that um, I never really experienced to that level before is that when I was in contact with him physically and practicing, my level would go. Mm. And then as soon as the touch stopped, it would But he, he was able to get this thing. And some of it had to do with his depth of knowledge of what he was doing and and commitment and uh, I, I don't really know but he had something that he would he could just put on you and then he would often say he would try to adjust how much energy out so oh that's too stiff oh no that's too collapsed all that he was trying to get all of that um, correct mm. And then uh, he talked about the, the feeling, why he uses the stick. Because he uses the stick, if you can get your feeling to go through the inanimate object, mm. when it comes to just you, it pops it up really quick. Because it was the opposite idea of, say, Japanese or Okinawan kabuto where you had, you had to make at least first level black belt before they started doing, and they weren't really teaching weapons, they were really just teaching weapons form. Mm. And some of it was even lower level, which is just an empty hand form that they put a weapon in. Um, it sounds like where Master Liang said that if you can extend your energy to the tip of the sword, it's much easier to get it into your hand. Exactly. So. That's exactly that it. kind of projecting out and uh, making that inanimate object animate. And I was thinking when you were talking, it was it, it sounds to me like he was almost letting you borrow his level. He's like pulling you up and like letting you borrow what's it like to be him it's like through the through the touch. Very much so. And uh, because of his traveling, it would have been different and I actually encouraged him to have a have a center and let people come to him. Oh, he, he didn't have like a central school? He was like on he the road? He didn't even have a, he was on the road the whole time. He didn't even have a domicile. He, did, he had nothing. He, Talk he, about dedication to the art, huh? He sacrificed his life, his happiness. Because, you know, traveling's fine, but all the time. Right, just we like, want to, we, but when you have to, it can be... First, traveling is new. <laughs> then it's not so new anymore. It is not so new anymore. And then, and then it got to the point, it, I think for him, he was unable to stop. Yeah. 
because you get so used to blowing in and I don't want to say using people up, but you know, it's really intense. But no, you wouldn't it's be wonderful. Able, you wouldn't be able to maintain that though. No. If you let a year go by, that's going to fall off because it's no longer going to be that. So he got a little addicted to the first date. Yeah. Oh yeah. And well, and you've taught seminars. I teach seminars. It's it's amazing to have all that attention, and it's all about that time. But I, yeah, I don't know how you could do it all the time. One after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, and then to a different country. So, so one and of the many, things. Uh, sorry, how many? About how many years was he doing that? Or how many decades? From the, I think he first came here in the early seventies. So then all the way up to his passing, he was still doing all that. When did he pass? 2002. So he's been gone like 21 years now. But because he traveled so much, and um, every place he went, he would promote the art. So he'd go out to karate studios and do, like, you know, I, I probably did 20, 25 demonstrations with him at various schools so he was constantly using somebody who wasn't really all that trained up so he got very proficient at if he's doing it with you and I'm sure you have the same experience if there's if there's two rows of students and they're trying to do something and they're having difficulty you just pull one person out you put yourself in there and they can immediately do it yep. so this is not, yeah. This is not, you know, uh, anything that that extra. Exactly. But with experience, you get better and better and better at doing that. Yeah. Yeah. The picture is worth a thousand words. A touch is worth ten thousand words. Yeah. There, there's no you know. substitute for it. So I think he got very, very good at that. And I'm not the only one that experienced that. And, and I experienced that a lot in classes. Some of it is the depth of knowledge of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. You know, if you're trying to learn something, it's different than knowing it and then yeah. exhibiting it, you yeah. know, or, or trying to transfer it off. And plus, from the professor, I got a whole lot of just, just through the time. And I think that there's uh, something about proximity too, mm. that yep. where our, our energetic fields are interacting, that it's impossible to get without that kind of proximity. Um, and then of course the touches, 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 touch. Um, I actually think that you get you get two distances for martial arts. You have the distance where you can't touch and the distance where you can't touch. Mm. And when you can't touch, you're relying on your eyes, mm. your hearing, your smell, your your sixth sense, you know, whatever, your gut feeling, mm -hmm. I don't know. But the eye is actually very easy to fool. Right. Magicians make their entire living on uh -huh. it. <laughs> Oh, you pulled a rabbit out of a hat. And, Did you see that? And actually, martial arts is, is has a lot of magic in it. Absolutely. You know, how, how do you get them to not block it so they can't see it? <laughs> you have to be able to see it. Or you're at the distance where you're touching, and to fool the touch is very difficult. Yes. To do. So I actually think all real martial arts is inside the, you know, you don't need vision. Master Choi would say, uh, you get to a certain distance and your skin becomes your eyes. But your skin is looking. You know, well, well, and then, the, you know, Yang style, they say listening energy. It's not an ear, right. but it's, it's the detection. Right. Yeah. 